Well, um, good day to everybody. It's it's very nice um, uh, to be with you at this lunchtime. And uh, thank you so much for giving us your time. We really appreciate the fact that everybody's so busy at the moment. In fact, one of the things about our leaders at the moment is sometimes we can end up being so busy being busy, we can't actually find the time to lift our heads and find ways not to be quite as busy uh, uh, and improve things. So uh, what we're gonna try and do this lunchtime with you is really talk about the opportunity we have to work better, get better outcomes, at work smarter in terms of the use of technology, uh, telemedicine, AI, to help in what is an incredibly important area of healthcare, uh, which is the uh, management of stroke. And um, uh, what you will see throughout the next hour is a series of uh, uh, conversations with myself, and I'll be able to uh, ask my colleagues as they come on screen to introduce themselves. And we're going to sort of pick up on a number of aspects of this, including a very practical care study that we'll share with you about how stroke care can be uh, improved using these techniques. Just to say um, uh, an obvious thing about, about stroke care to get us into this, it remains uh, sadly a major killer in this country. Um, uh, we know that every minute counts in terms of the ability to uh, act speedily in the context of stroke and the, the dramatic impact that speak and have on recovery. Uh, we also know that the, it represents, sadly, the kind of inequalities that we see in healthcare in this country, even though we, we pride ourselves on having one of the fairest and, uh, and, and most equitable systems. Uh, and we know that as a consequence of not using technology in the way that we could, we're actually running services inefficiently at a time when we absolutely need every resource and penny we can get to try and tackle some of the backlog for care. So a hugely important business today. And I'm delighted to kick off with uh, um, my uh, colleague, Linda, Linda Simpson. Linda, do you want to introduce yourself and then we can get into some of your experience? Hi, thanks, Mike. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for spending time with us today. So my name's Linda Sitson. I'm a nurse by background, um, and I currently manage the out-of-hours stroke telemedicine service across the east of England. So essentially what we do is provide expertise to seven of our region's hospitals in the out-of-hours, that's overnight, weekends, and bank holidays, to be able to look after our acute ischemic stroke patients. We know, as Mike was saying, that stroke patients uh, time is very much brain and what we were finding across the region is that many of our patients weren't reaching the hospital in time to be able to be thrombolized those that were, were thrombolizable suffering acute ischemic stroke we also know we have a lack of stroke consultants in the uk particularly in england so it was a way telemedicine was a way of using um our expertise that we were lacking this number of stroke consultants to be able to bring those in virtually to be able to assess our stroke patients and then give them the correct treatment prior to that patients were often moved between hospitals which meant that we weren't able to provide them with thrombolysis so we've been going for 12 years now actually next month um, and we've now assessed over 5,000 patients in general um, we have a about a 40% thrombolysis rate, so that represents 40% of the patients who present to the stroke service, telemedicine service, are thrombolysis. That doesn't represent the thrombolysis rate across the region. And we still know that most of the people that we don't thrombolyse, the 60% we don't unfortunately arrive because they're out of time. And we know that we have a four and a half hour time limit from symptom onset to, to being able to thrombolyse our patients. And there's kind of a whole myriad of regions behind that. So I manage this um, service. I work with a, a brilliant technical manager and I work with a wonderful stroke coordinator who looks after the, one, the 12 stroke consultants, one of who's on the, on the call today, um, to be able to deliver that service. And it's, it's very much a seamless service. We've been going um, for a number of years now and we're just kind of accepted as part of the stroke service. Um, and we know that we save our hospitals uh, money. We're cost effective. We know we're, we're good on quality and we know that if we're able to thrombolize our patients, we know that they have a shorter length of stay, they have a much better recovery rate as well, um, and return to, to full life. Um, we know that disability from stroke is, is cost the, the NHS millions a year, we know that. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. We've been able to use technology, the right place, right care, right time to benefit our patients. And we're very keen that we keep them at the centre, essentially, of what we do. Brilliant. And in terms of the challenges that you've had to overcome, because the logic of what you've been doing is is obviously yeah. there. The outcomes are hugely impressive. 
Yet this isn't uh, sadly uh, the, the norm across the country. I know from my days working at the NHS Confederation and strategic health authorities, this has been sort of more elusive than it should be. What, what, what are the challenges that you've had to overcome really, Linda, in setting up that service? So when I started looking after the service, it was actually set up by, by my consultant, one of the stroke nurse um, consultants um, at Asenbrook's Hospital, which hosts us, although we, they don't actually use the service. So we started with four hospitals um, and four consultants. Um, and I think the need to be able to provide that equality that you talked about earlier, providing the same care in hours as we do out of hours, was really important. Um, each hospital would probably have to employ three or four consultants to deliver that out of hours care. We, we know they're just not there, there aren't enough stroke consultants. So from the hospital's perspective, there was a clinical push to do this, to provide clinical care and clinical governance. And also there is, at the end of the day, healthcare costs money. There was an economic um, price to this in terms of, we know this is a much cheaper way of providing expert stroke care to our patients. I think it's important to say that technology would never replace that face-to-face -face consultation, but I think if it's used wisely and it's implemented and integrated into an existing healthcare system, it can work. But certainly some of the challenges that we see um, working with all those different hospitals, and I don't work for them, I work with them, is about changing the way we practice. And I, none of us particularly like change. It seems everything seems to be changing all the time and very quickly. But I think when you can demonstrate that you're giving the same level of care by bringing that stroke consultant to the patient's bedside, be it virtually, and you'll be able, you can d demonstrate those outcomes, that's really important. And I think the other thing about it, it's about people. It's not really about the technology works. We don't worry too much about that, but it's about preparing the people. And we work with our stroke nurses who are, are you know, above and beyond are absolutely brilliant across the region. So I make sure that in each hospital I have a clinical champion. It's usually the stroke nurse and they're the ones that can actually make this change happen for me. They can speak to the stroke consultants. We ask that each hospital who works with us puts a stroke consultant on the rotor. And that means we have a very collegiate group of individuals and everybody benefits from it. So when people can see actually if we join this partnership, we're all going to benefit. One of our consultants is going to be on that in that partnership as part of the rotor and they can help us with some of the issues which will always come up. Healthcare changes all the time. So I think it's, it's about change and it's about managing that. It's about leadership and management from my perspective, but also working with those different leaders and managers within that trust. And they can change regularly as well. So keeping those relationships going are really important. And it's about communicating. It's about education and training. That's really important. And I have an education lead on one of my stroke consultants. So we make sure that this stroke nurse is help in, in assessing and referring the right stroke patients. Not that they guide the junior doctors on that as well, they make the decision if this patient is mobilised by the, the criteria. Um, and that's, that's not a, a pathway agreed across seven hospitals, which is quite a rare thing to do as well, but it's never the case pathway that everybody agrees to so we're all working on the same duty. And again, I think people see if they're buying into that and everybody's getting the same care and there's that quality, I think it's more practical for us and certainly it's the trust system that 12 years and we've got yeah thank you i think you made some really important points there just just sort of picking out some of them it, very often the technology comes in isolation without the kind of understanding how it impacts into clinical process and um, helps people so that training and support for people feels vital your ability to scale because you've got a number of organizations seeing benefit and support particularly at times of workforce crisis and also i think that issue of how do you systematize this such that if key individuals who've championed its introduction move on this is embedded into the way that we do things and you don't lose that enthusiasm so we'll come back to a number of those themes and i know you're going to join me uh, uh, later on in this call uh, uh, after i spoke to saji but perhaps before we do um uh, elaine who's supporting that's unvisionable. Uh, uh, there's a poll here and it'd be, be nice to see if people wanted to uh, give us their sense now uh, of their first part and we'll, 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 we'll take a quick stock of does your practice use telemedicine? Where are you up to now currently? Could you, could you vote on that please? So the poll's live so if anyone can just input their answers and we'll close it in a second and um, 
the results will be on the screen and then we can head back to Mike. Great, I think we'll close the poll now and head back to you, Mike. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I missed the results, but we might come back to those if we can, Elaine. But, but I've, I've still got limits. So I'm going to ask um, um, Sajid, to, uh, Sajid Allen to step forward. I know you've been part of this scheme uh, in a very practical sense, uh, Sajid. So um, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, say a bit about your involvement uh, uh, with, with, with this work to date? Here we go. Here's Sajid. Yeah. Sajid, I can't hear you. I'm just wondering if we've got you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. OK. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Mike, I missed the first part of your question. There. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just asking you to introduce yourself and say very quickly a bit about your involvement. And then I was going to, you know, sort of probe that a little further. Yeah. Sure. I'm, I'm Sajid Allen, one of the stroke consultants at Ipswich Hospital. I'm currently the clinical lead for stroke services here and I've been working with Linda for quite some while now. I am actually one of the consultants on the regional telemedicine rota and um, we, we've been using uh, the telemedicine service uh, not only in the way it was set up, but uh, we've used uh, certain aspects of the technology to help us in our own hospital because uh, just like any other trust, we have our unique set of challenges and technology has been quite a savior for us in sort of trying to manage our workload with a, a good work-life balance. Brilliant. And in terms of why you as an individual sort of sought this way of working or, or, or you know, what, what was it that sort of like got you to the point where you thought actually there's a real opportunity here to help patients in a different way? What, what, what you know, what was it a personal interest or had you seen evidence or what, what, how did you really sort of like try to get involved in this and think about virtual support and remote care? Okay, so I, I suppose the honest answer would be, uh, you know, desperation uh, 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 and seeking a, 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 a solution to it. Because uh, if you know Ipswich, uh, we are a sort of a semi-rural area and we are quite far away from anything else. Um, so trying to attract new colleagues uh, is very difficult purely based on the geography uh, of it. And, you know, we look after approximately 600 stroke patients a year. Uh, we have uh, 1,200 patients per year to our TIA service. And there are only three of us um, in the actual stroke service. And uh, as it gets busier, you know, uh, we, we were finding it increasingly difficult to manage a work-life balance. And, um, Hence, uh, we looked into the idea of remote working, which still allows you to sort of be at home and spend some time with the family, but does allow you to sort of extend your working hours a little bit longer or provide support. Because one of the things my colleagues and I were very clear about is that, you no, know, we don't want to spend any longer in the hospital than we need to. But at the same time, we didn't want to compromise patient care and this is sort of achieves a sort of a finer balance between the two. Yeah and I, and I think your point about individual sort of working life is a really important one in terms of the well-being of our staff but also speaks to the fact that you can supply services without having to be uh, you know sort of committed physically into a particular person I think I think that's the excitement of this opportunity bringing expertise at the right time and I know you have in evening sessions as part of that and uh, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering you know that that's not necessarily as common and I'm, and I'm wondering whether or not there is a opportunity here for others to learn from that experience of distribution of your time and availability in terms of, uh, of the benefits. No, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I'll, you know, go on it with two points. So the first uh, worry a lot of people have about uh, remote working is they say that that is not gold standard. Uh, and I always counter that with saying, well, actually, it, you know, uh, 
if I don't do this, there'll be no standard to start off with, and that will compromise your patient care. And secondly, if you have a trusted assessor at the other end, you have more time, you have access to all the patient's records, you have access to their scans, and you're able to communicate with them and their family. Um, you physically placing a hand on them would add very little uh, in terms of the consultation, and it's just getting people to change their minds around it. Um, and you know, uh, this is the sort of formula we used. Uh, not only we currently use it out of hours um, in supporting our stroke nurses, because as you know, most stroke services in the UK will know that their sort of mimic rate is very high. So for every maybe four or five patients referred, maybe two of them would end up being a stroke. Um, and a lot of this does happen out of hours. Um, and it's again supporting your accident emergency department, supporting your stroke nurses, getting a specialist review, um, you know, in, in, in that time frame stops that patient from being admitted or being put under the wrong pathway. Uh, so you can either admit, discharge or provide specialist services. Um, and that seems to help a lot. And on a more positive note, when you're coming into work the next morning, you already know the patient. So that reduces your workload from having to see a new patient to someone who's been there uh, overnight and you've already reviewed them. Um, we also did make use of this uh, during the pandemic. You know, we're a very small team and at certain points during that, you know, we've had to self-isolate or not come into work because of contact or us getting COVID and we were able to work remotely and also if we had to review a patient who was on one of the COVID isolation wards, we were able to do that very effectively using this technology. So it does have its benefits. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, one of the things that you mentioned in passing there, and, and th 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 this event, as you know, is brought to you by Visible and Brainomics, who have an interest in this clearly, but have got a much, much more broader interest in the uptake of this approach. But clearly, one of the things that you come across in terms of perceived barriers is, well, the quality of the information that I'm seeing on screen or the availability of the comprehensive. You mentioned the, the the fact that you have access to records and you have um, you know high quality sort of uh, remote links that make this you know feasible and I just wonder if you comment on that in terms of you know the safety if you like in fact because the more information you have the more accurate pictures etc you you can you can be really confident in that diagnosis. Uh, that you're making and I, I mean how much of a factor was that in terms of your confidence as a clinician as you started to sort of work this way? So again you know I think one of the key things to making this sort of technology workable is um, the your trusted assessors on the ground and you know we, we've trained our trusted assessors ourselves um, we know their capabilities we know their limits um, but you know if I was to go and see a patient now in our accident emergency department, I would have no information apart from what they've presented with. Whereas if I was seeing that patient from home, I'd usually get a five minute heads up. That gives me the time to sort of log on, see all their uh, previous sort of discharge letters, their past medical history, you know, review the scan in my living room, uh, you know, in peace and quiet, um, and and then uh, do the remote assessment, which which is probably much more satisfying than me walking into A and E, and it's you know really busy. There's sort of alarms going off everywhere, and you're rushing because you're. Uh, so I think there are definitely some advantages, and 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 as I as I said. Um, if, if there are certain uh, examinations which you think are appropriate that your trusted assessors can't do, there's always someone in the hospital who can do that and then report back to you. So, as I said before, me adding, uh, going there to put my hand on the patient adds very little to the actual outcome. And th this is also more the case uh, when you have uh, things like brainomics um, in the mix um, where you know you you're 
confidence is much higher because um, as a stroke consultant and especially someone working in a, a district general, we don't have access to radiologists or neuroradiologists all the time. So we've had to make use of learning um, how to read CT angiograms and CT scans ourselves. Um, and having a, a smart or AI software confirming your decision making simplifies things a lot more and gives you that bit of confidence to make that decision. And we find it enormously helpful. Fabulous. That's a beautiful segue into our next section. But again, I think we do have a poll and we have a question there about working uh, in terms of evening uh, support. And again, it would be great if people could just um, complete that. And Mike, whilst we're letting people put in their answers for this poll, let me give you the results of the last poll. So 50% okay. were did not use telemedicine to support stroke okay. patients. 25% of our attendees do use it, and then 25% were unsure. So a, a big response of people that don't currently use it. And okay. we'll close this poll now um, and it seems that 100% um, of people do think that this uh, using the the evening virtual clinics would benefit the team so that's an overwhelming success story uh, I'll have that to you. okay thank you Elaine um, so let's bring Linda back in the room if we can as well and I want to talk specifically now about the case study that has been done. Uh, Sajid talked about brainomics and uh, and visionable working together on this case study. And so, uh, but perhaps, perhaps start with you, Linda, having you know sort of just spoke to Sajid about the beginning of this. How has this come about? And then I'll come back to the practical ways in which this supports people. So, Linda, how did this come about and this case study, and what, what are you actually doing here? So how it came about with the development and treatment for um, stroke patients is mechanical thrombectomy. Um, at the moment, we use a different system to share the, the CT scans that we have of our patients and our, our CT angiograms, but we find that currently across the east of England, we need to refer into London for our mechanical thrombectomies. And we know that the CTAs, the CT angiograms, can take quite a long time to be transferred over the current system. So again, going back to time is brain, that can take up to an hour. And, and as Sajid will allude to, in that time, you're still trying to get an ambulance back to the patient and to, to sort the referral out. So to be able to use an AI system like Brainomics to, so that everybody can instantly see the outcomes of that CTA to help plan that care, particularly for the, um, the INRs, the interventional neuroradiologists at the referral site, that you're, the, the London site, makes a massive difference in patient care. Um, we're hoping that this is going to be rolled out across the region soon, but I know Ips, which is one of the hospitals, was, as is Peterborough, that currently uses Brainomics. And from my point of view in managing services, whilst our bit is really the acute side of it, it's really rewarding that you can see an assistant that the patients have then been referred to a mechanical thrombectomy, and then they're transferred back to the hospital within 24 hours, much more improved. And clearly, Sajid can talk about the, the clinical aspect of those patients. But to be able to use that technology again, to bring in that expertise when and where you need it, to actually allow those patients to get this really valuable treatment. And, and often these patients have very large strokes, so have the potential to be extremely disabled if they're, if they're not being treated and again we have six hours from the symptom onset to, to what they call the groin puncture when we start that thrombectomy um, procedure so it's hugely valuable to be able to have this technology and, and visual or brain are working together to see if, if we can bring those systems together you talked earlier about having these disparate systems and them not integrating you know and to have those brought together would, would be amazing it would make a real difference in terms of those referrals for the clinicians on the ground because time is brain and at three o'clock in the morning you want something to work really quickly um, and without any flaws with no technical issues so that's going to be really fantastic when we can get this rolled out across the region. Thanks Linda. and from your perspective Sarah, you, you talked about that kind of support to the, the, the opportunity of AI to really help you just say a little bit about how that works and then you know what you do with that as a consequence of getting that really accurate assessment. So uh, I'll just take you through, uh, you know, the amount of things 
things that need to sort of line up when you're trying to refer someone for thrombectomy. I mean, for, for, you know, this might be a lot uh, easier and smoother if you work in a, a sort of a big teaching hospital, uh, whereas in, in a DGH, you know, things function slightly on a slower uh, pace. And, you know, in, in that time, you have to get a CT angiogram organized. Uh, you have to then have a look at it, um, wait, uh, you know, a, a lot of the DGH, especially out of hours, um, they are, you know, the radiology services are subcontracted to a different company uh, who can take up to half an hour to get a report back to you. Then you have to refer to to your the thrombectomy center, wait for them to have a look at it, and call you back. And then you have to discuss, uh, uh, you know, what the plan of action with the patient or, or the family, organize transport, and in a lot of the time, chase up the transport. So uh, the workload is extremely high at that point. Um, Whereas, you know, when you've got a, a software like Brainomics, um, you know, what we as clinicians are always worried that, you know, have we missed a, a large vessel occlusion? And if you've had a look at the scan yourself and you've got confirmation from uh, the software, you know, which concurs with what you thought, it gives you a high degree of confidence to say, actually, there is no large vessel occlusion, this person does not need a referral. Whereas if you think it, they have one and, and the software concurs with you, again, that high degree of uh, uh, confidence to make that onward referral. And the last one I did, I, I, I told them, can you, you know, the scan should be on, on, on Brainomics. You know, they were able to have a look at it, get back to me within a, a couple of minutes. Uh, and then we were able to send the patient for thrombectomy. Um, so anything which reduces your workload during that critical phase is extremely beneficial. Um, and, uh, you know, as I say, in addition to this, um, some of this stuff we're having to do remotely because you know that's one of the things for the telemedicine service we just don't have the number of consultants to cover the east of england for each hospital to have an own consultant um, and by pooling together you know especially in, an, in a time where resources are very tight this is what you would classify as sort of efficient working making best resource uh, use um, so not only is it beneficial for your consultants because now i'm on one in 12 on call as opposed to one in three your patients are getting a specialist review. Uh, your trust is saving money by, you know, making use of the resources available in the region. And as I, I say, the, the the software which is there helps the clinician extremely uh, quickly to make a decision, thus benefiting patients. Yeah, I, I mean, this, this this whole sense that's emerging. Uh, for, for us who, who are not as familiar with that of the of the sort of telemedical platform creating wider accessibility to expertise the use of software to support the expertise of our clinicians and reinforce and give them greater insights and the speed at which now that, that translates into action for patients and the outcomes that improve as a consequence i mean this feels i mean it's almost like the case study about why you know the, the nhs should be really investing more and more in this use of technology to support the way in which we work into the future so i'm i'm going to just give linda a bit of a curveball here and say um, why do why do we think that you know this isn't universally applied what, what you know what what is what, what gets in the way when we've heard such a powerful case of of, of this and what, what what should we be thinking i mean is this something that integrated care boards because they have scale now should be really pushing hard as part of their strategy is it clinical resistance that we have to overcome you, you know what 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 what, are, what, are, what is it that we should be doing Linda? Um, I think I think there's still some clinical resistance there, perhaps with some of the older consultants. Certainly, that's my my personal and experience, and that there's a, a difficulty again that goes back to changing practice. So we've been to some hospitals have expressed an interest 
um, in the partnership and joining us. Um, and then the stroke consultant will say, well, I come in, I only live around the corner. And I think there's an element of perhaps letting go of some of their practices to the nurses to be able to do this. And this goes back to education and training again. So we're ensuring to the nurses at, um, at Sadgis Hospital, for example, are able to thrombolize that there's always a, a medical registrar available. But I think I wonder whether some doctors feel that they're kind of letting go that's part of the practice. I thrombolize the patient. That's my role. So trying to persuade them to do that virtually, that's kind of almost a big step for them to take. Um, some hospitals, it's an economic so we've got you know consultants retiring and they they are not able to recruit so they they see that as as a way forward um i think sometimes it's seen as too big a hill to climb in the first instance because there's quite a lot of work to do to get this established once it's up and running it's fairly seamless and we're a bit swan like it sort of glides along it's quite a lot of work going on under the feet under the water but i sometimes to see so we had recently one hospital who um, thought that we weren't NHS. So there's that perception that we're some outside company. And we said no and sent us a form to fill in. This is just to give you an example from the IT department. So involving them at the beginning is really important. And they weren't able to come to the first meeting. And they sent us a form to fill in as a provider. And we said, well, we're not a provider. We're, we're NHS. And they came back and said, well, we don't have a form for that. So it was all like their structure wasn't set up for this kind of service that's NHS but we're providing this kind of weird service so we've always kind of sat slightly outside what people perceive particularly from an IT point of view and of course they're very we need to we be working with the IT department that's really important once it's set up and running we don't really need to deal with them so much so I think there's bringing in all those different elements and, and hospitals work in silos often don't we and we kind of work horizontally so I think that's a little bit of a challenge for some hospitals to see that we're working with all these different departments so that's sometimes difficult make all those different people understand that you're all important we need to be speaking to all of you um and that that can be a challenge and and certainly whilst you know virtual things are great and virtual meetings are great certainly i think it's still important that we sit down and talk to people face to face when we're setting up something as important as it is um, and that's been difficult to do for a whole number of reasons being short of time and obviously yeah. and whilst I think that's one of the positive things that's come out of the pandemic is everybody's accepting digital health as a thing actually getting it up and running and established is a is a little bit more difficult and it's easy to get it set up but actually the sustainability you need somebody looking after it and making sure that it's managed and that it's running smoothly and that can also be a challenge to free up somebody to do that i think okay thank you. well thank you both for now i'm going to bring you back uh, in a second and uh, when we get to the final bit and uh, get you all back together as a panel but i'm going to come on to um uh two very important people adam from visionable and riaz from brainomics uh, thank you for joining us and uh, we heard a bit about the supply side challenge here we have technologies which you guys know completely could transform services and yet we haven't had that uptake, but you're going to talk us through a little bit about how it's felt from your side of the case study and, you know, how you've arrived at what you do and, and what are going to be the next steps. So, so why don't, let me start with uh, Riaz, then I'll come to Adam. So, so Riaz, um, you know, introduce yourself and just tell us a bit about your side of this journey and the case study and the, 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 the outcomes we're getting. Riaz. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mike and the team for inviting me. Um, so it's really interesting to hear about the real world challenges. So my name is Riaz Rahman, VP Healthcare Global with Brainomics. We're a UK company which was a spin out from Oxford University. And one thing I'm very proud about, we have frontline NHS physicians on our team. And lots of the challenges that have been discussed about today, uh, we've created a technology platform um, that hopefully addresses uh, some of this and I'll share some impact data for the audience because I think some very compelling reasons to use this uh, beyond just some of the challenges that you've seen from Dr. Alam. Uh, and what's also exciting from us is we've we seen a real value of trying to join up a system so that a physician can start to look across the whole pathway. So I think one thing that everybody is very cognizant of in stroke, it's so time sensitive. So how can we join up the information in the pre-acute phase and as you've seen, many people are now working in a hub and spoke model, how we can support the intra-hospital phase, which is very challenging when there are multiple hospitals working together. Thanks, Riz. And, and, and Adam, from Visionable's point of view, clearly you are 
you know the, the sort of platform and I, I, I'll declare my interest because I work with you which is why I've been invited to chair this session um, uh, but I work with you as an independent somebody who goes around the service and has run many many services across the NHS for a long time um, Visible has enormous capability what was it you know about the, you, what, the stroke experience that was so compelling from a visionable perspective in terms of proving the value that you can bring them so I think one of the key elements of value that we can bring as a technology is the high quality imaging that we provide. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that you are able to transmit those images, um, share screens, share data, unlimited data sources through the platform, um, which effectively like no other. So that's one of the sort of key elements. Also, when they actually do pull the cart out, um, in some cases when, they're, when the patient is in hospital, you're also able to control the camera, which if um, the physician is actually at home, that can really bring that um, like use case to life um, on this case. So it's that quality of the technology here that really makes a difference for clinical purposes and um, excellent. So, so Riaz, you mentioned that we have some data. Um, Elaine, can we show that? That, that might should be, be up on the screen now. Yeah, Riaz, it might be a bit small for some people of my age to see <laughs> do you want to do you want to just kind of give us the highlights of that because it yeah yeah absolutely so what i thought i'd share with the audience first of all you've seen some of the real world challenges so what does brainomics do it essentially provides um artificial intelligence and one of the things that we try to do is not to make that black box and it's really important to be able to have instantaneous image sharing so that's the challenge so if you're a stroke patient that presented at ipswich what we provided is a technology that automatically within one to two minutes a brain scan can be processed using AI and the picture on the right without going into too much technical information today brings out a whole set of information so for example have we detected an LVO are there good collaterals with the patient is this patient fitting the kind of standards that you would like to be able to make a transfer or conversely is that a kind of patient that maybe wouldn't benefit from mechanical thrombectomy so what you'll find is that the images are available instantaneously on both sides so Ipswich and the Royal London that really drives um, decision making to optimize the pathway uh, and what we're really now seeing is the AI has been validated to essentially be e equivalent to an expert neuroradiologist but it doesn't make the decision for you but combine that data with an expert neuroradiologist, you can start to make quicker decisions about transferring patients. And on the bottom, what I wanted to share with you, um, the project with it, which has been really exciting, it's one of the largest stroke AI connected networks in the country. It has over a patient population of 9 million now. And we're looking at two things. Can we increase access to this life-saving procedure? And what we've showcased is that with the uh, Royal London Hospital, we've increased it uh, by over 163 patients in a calendar year. And also we've demonstrated that the MRS scores, so this is looking at the functionality of the patient, uh, functional kind of response from the patient has increased from a baseline of 33 to 55. So what that actually means is you're treating more patients, demonstrating that you can do it better and demonstrating be better patient outcomes. And where we are now as a, a company is, is trying to work with Visionable to say what can we do in some of the other known bottlenecks, which is around the ambulance phase, and making sure all that information is available really quickly to drive more patients. And then the one caveat I put on this as well, all of this great result was uh, delivered through COVID phase one. So these are data from the first phase. We went live in February at the Royal London to about February of this year. Excellent. Adam, any sort of thoughts from you in terms of those outcomes? You, you must be delighted as well about that. Of course, of course. I mean, I think one of the key aims that we try to strive for here at Visionable and also twinned with sort of collaboration with Riaz and his team at Brainomics is we want to try and help some of those workforce pressures, especially um, that we are we are facing within this area. Um, but of course, any sort of benefit um, to patient care is what we're all here to do at the end of the day. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on that bit with you both. Uh, the, the, the procurement process <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, how, how uh, Linda mentioned this a little bit, but, but you know, my experience is that, that there is such a lot of really impressive capability out there 
Uh, clearly today we're talking about a hugely important capability in a field that if we don't apply it has direct consequences for poor outcomes for patients. Um, uh, how easy have you found it really to get into these conversations at scale to sort of bring this technology and clearly this is a case study so we're learning as we go but but could we be doing more is it you know is it the business case not strong enough or is it bureaucracy that gets in the way of this what what what, 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 what i want to just touch on that because i think some of the challenge here is not the rationale for doing this it's actually that somehow we, we've got processes that you know get in the way of it somehow I'll gladly answer that, Mike. So uh, as a UK company, you are very vested in the NHS. So what's been interesting, uh, when the policy changed, when the NHS long-term plan specifically called out AI and stroke, I think that drove a lot of the decision-making. But also we've been um, assisted by the ISDN structures. So up until the last 12, 15 months, there was a lot of talk, a lot of interest, and we had lots of interested parties, but actually most of our traction was in Europe but we've circled back to the UK and now we have over 75 hospitals live, will be over 100 by the end of the year. But to give you the sense of scale, we've built business cases that are really compelling now. So we're the only stroke AI vendor that has four national country wins. Wales is one of them, uh, Hungary and Poland, and we have one we'll announce very soon. So that's a, a, even just with those four countries, a patient population of over 50 million using this technology. But just in the UK, I think the ISDN structures have been helpful. But prior to that, uh, and the other challenge is uh, lots of trusts are having to assess multiple AI systems. So which ones to choose and which ones will give return on investment in which areas. So things have changed, but for the positive, but uh, definitely have some scars over the past few years to try to build a story and build a narrative, but that's not a bad thing. Yeah, Adam, any thoughts on this in terms of um, uh, your experience? So I'd say from our end, I mean, as I think Linda touched on earlier in the conversation, um, COVID did help the use of video in general um, throughout healthcare systems throughout the UK worldwide. Um, we are also a UK company. So of course, we're very invested in ensuring that all patients and clinicians alike have as easy a time as possible. I think the thing is now that part of the challenge for us is that we, we're trying to sort of push through the use of video um, as much as we can. And obviously with working with Brainomics, I think with as we go forwards and try and make further integrations into both of the platforms, hopefully in turn, that should mean things like single sign-on should be slightly easier um, going forwards. I think in terms of the procurement routes, um, I mean, things could always be easier in the, in the way, but I think that everyone is trying to say, solve those same challenges together, whether they be in the system or slightly removed from it, um, such as us. Brilliant. Okay, well, listen, let, let's bring um, uh, Sajid and Linda back. Um, we've got our full panel. Um, and Elaine, you've been monitoring. Uh, this is an opportunity for people to ask questions. I've got quite a lot still, but, but it may well be that um, some of our participants uh, listening have got questions. Uh, Elaine, anything jumping out from, uh, from your end? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions that have come through as you've been presenting and discussing amongst yourselves. So one of the questions is, what other improvements could you look to make with technology like Brainomics and Vision Bowl? OK, well, well, well let's, um, I, I think we've got some specific interests around stroke here, but where else do, I mean, I'll just open it to anybody on the panel, really. Um, where else do you think this kind of way of working with this kind of clinical AI support with a really high quality platform could, could make a difference? I know you've been all committed to this particular work, but do you see other areas where this would be immediately uh, uh, applicable? Um. Mike, if I take that, um, uh, one thing we uh, didn't talk about today was uh, Linda and ourselves. We, we piloted uh, the stroke mimic and uh, paramedic project um, uh, where, you know, again, our trusted assessors were the paramedics and they would be going into people's homes with, with a, a, a device and we would remote assess them uh, and and again um, thereby preventing hospital admissions now um, you know 
I think Linda would be quite happy if I shared uh, some of the data there. You know, the majority of the patients that would have otherwise come into hospital, we managed to avoid their admission. So admission avoidance um, is uh, uh, an area with paramedics um, uh, that we could use uh, uh, this technology. I mean, we've already demonstrated it, that it works and it's usable. Um, the other areas, which I, I think I've, I've told Linda quite a few times is, um, you know, uh, again, for DGHs, uh, sometimes you don't have a specialist on call uh, over the weekend, and it's trying to maximise what resources you have in the region. Uh, so if someone needed a specialist neurologist review over the weekend, uh, there's no reason why they couldn't undertake a remote assessment uh, look through their records, have a scan. So it, it is applicable to a, a lot of places, uh, you know, um, uh, you you could have, uh, you know, some places where, you know, they've got respiratory care centers um, and, you know, where, you know, you need to make decisions about um, whether the patient's care needs to be escalated, and, uh, respiratory centres, they, they could use that as well um, because you have all the information. So I, I don't think the application's uh, limited to stroke. Um, I, it, it's, yeah, it's not universally applicable, but it's certainly applicable for a lot of things. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts before I move on to my next question and the next question? Yeah, I, I, okay. I could probably add to that, Mike. Yeah, I think Sajid, so. I fully agree. I think one of the exciting things about Visionable, it, it's applicable across multiple pathways. And just to give the Bradomics um, a few points of where we can go with the technology, we're already moving into cancer and interstitial lung disease. So big areas where similar, similar challenges, where high mortality rates and lack of good quality information. Um, but also there's a, another part where AI can support um, patient selection for trials. So we're having a lot of interest from pharmaceutical organizations. So bringing their products to market quicker because we're able to optimize some of their trials, which in some cases can take many years. Um, that's a very exciting space to be as well. Fabulous. Okay. Well, let's move on. Elaine, do we have another question you mentioned? Yeah, and I'll roll this um, two questions into one. One of our attendees is asking, we're really busy, we just don't have the time to learn this new technology. And someone else is asking, how easy is it to start using it? So those are two in one for you. Okay, um, so um, time to learn technology. Linda, why don't I come to you and you can start on that. So one of the things we, as I mentioned earlier, really important to us is education and training. We spend a lot of time with our um, stroke nurses how to assess a stroke patient to refer for telemedicine, but it's also good for their own development. We spend about two minutes showing them how to use the cart, uh, the telemedicine cart. It's simply a clinical device with a hospital PC and a screen and a CCTV camera. We are told pretty much everywhere we go is that it. So we've worked with Visionable over the years. It literally logs on for you. You literally don't have to do anything. The telemedicine works. The technology works. It's very, very easy to use. We have a cart in A&E, usually somewhere near where a stroke bed, if, if there's a dedicated one, and we have a cart on the ward. I know Sajid uses the, the an iPad on a nice stand that he can move around for his virtual clinic, so it doesn't matter what you use it on. The, the Visionable software is really easy to use. I don't have to worry about that. The server doesn't go down. The quality is good. I can then focus on getting the clinical teams to assess the patient and understand when to refer the patient. So that's that's the easy bit. If you can log on to Teams, you can log on to Visionable. It really is not difficult. And that's really important. And the software development guys at Visionable have been great because we've been feeding back to them over 12 years. So what you're seeing now is a product that's been refined over, over a decade to get this really simple to use. It's got to be easy to use at three o'clock in the morning when you're not familiar with the software, it's just got to be able to turn on and work, and it does. Yeah, and Adam and Rios, in terms of actually introducing that rather than training people once it's introduced, is that straightforward to sort of like connect in and sort of make sure it's uh, uh, it's it's um, consistent with other sort of uh, bits of software and things? I mean, in terms of the actual installation of the program, very simple. I mean, it's like installing any, any sort of uh, sort of software program within your computer um, that's you have one already on the PC um, at the um, at the clinician's end and then just one on the cart as well and internet connection that's about all you need effectively so yeah simple as you can get 
Yeah, and from my side, I probably uh, would like to hear Dr. Allen's uh, experience of it, because once the system is set up, that's probably the harder part to get through governance and get it up and running. But actually, our whole premise here is not to change drastically what you do. You know, if I've said to you that um, it's a time sensitive pathway, the last thing I want to do is to expand that unnecessary time. So the whole idea of the technology, it's within your fingertips within one to two minutes. And uh, I really like the way Dr. Allen's talked about the real world challenges of where can you access the information? So it can be on the mobile app, on your PAC system or the web UI. But in terms of Dr. Alam, have you found it when, once you've had the system up and running, it should essentially just feed you the images automatically? And what's your experience that? You know, absolutely, Riaz. And, uh, you know, you're you're quite correct uh, that, you know, when I want to look at a scan for a patient, I go onto our web browser, which brings up the scans and the Brainomics editions are the last two images. OK, so it hasn't changed anything. And, and, and literally the software will tell you this is the aspect score, large vessel occlusion detected or not. So it's literally two lines that you have to look at once once you've finished your interpretation. And in terms of the uh, um, the visionable software, um, I, I'm afraid to admit, Linda, I don't think I ever received formal training for it. But if <laughs> if you if you can if you can use a a, a, a phone application and you can do Teams, um, you'd be absolutely fine with it. It's that simple. Yeah. So the fact that you can use it with no formal training, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I've been using it for I don't know how many years now, but there you go. Him, like, I'm, I'm, my bad. <laughs> so, so my math, my math, Linda, we've been wasting two minutes of everybody's lives in giving them some training. But anyway, no, it's a bit serious. Um, in, in terms of that question that started this, which is about we're just under so much pressure that we we haven't got time. I, I, I mean, I, I feel very strongly about this. I've been a leader in the health system for a long time, is that we are lacking now the, the sense in our leaders that, that, that says the only way we'll ever be able to deal with operational pressures is to lift our heads from them and find ways to deal with these challenges in a quicker, more effective way using technology in the last but one decade when we reduce waiting times we have money to throw at things we don't have money to throw at the demand we're facing now what we do have is data which allows us to target people properly and technology and uh, really if, if, if the leaders of our organizations aren't recognizing that and allowing our frontline and middle line management to sort of like lift up and see what they could do differently then we're just perpetuating the fact we're all on a hamster wheel that will go around and around together until we literally fall off as will everybody on our patients so so i think there's a real leadership challenge in this and um you know if you're not getting that time then i think you should shout very loudly to the senior people in your organization and say we can't go on doing what we've always done and here's technology that can help us let's find some time to embrace that it really is so important My, any other I... questions yes of course yeah uh, may I just add to that, you know, I feel, you know, a very personal connection to that comment. And, you know, as I said to you right at the start, it was desperation. You know, we, we never had time to do any of this, but we also realized that, uh, you, you know, the clinical commitment and you'll always be busy, that's not going to change. But it's, you know, how you make it sustainable, because the rate we were going at very soon, one of us was going to burn out. Um, so uh, I think, uh, yeah, you'll never have enough time, but actually this way you, you try and achieve a better work-life balance, which makes your team more sustainable. Yeah, thank you. Um, Elaine, any others? Okay, we're going to go to our final poll, which is not a poll actually, it's just a, 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 a slide that will allow you, if you want to hear more about the things we've talked about today, um, then obviously just select one of the boxes and uh, I know that people would be very happy to speak to you. Yes, and Mike, just one more thing. I think it's um, important to let everyone know that's on the call that we'll be providing them with access to the case study that we've touched on during this session. There is a lot of hard data in there, so it's an excellent read and we'll send that out to everybody that's on the call. So if you would like to speak to the team at Visionable or Brainomics, please just pop that in the poll now and we'll make sure that we follow up with you afterwards. But that case study will go out to everyone. 
which is great. So I'll pass over you to, to you to wrap up. Yeah, and, and just to say, of course, that if you are watching this from um, uh, uh, the online version rather than the live version, if you want to follow that up, obviously, uh, Visionable and Brainomics, I think we'll be delighted to sort of follow that up with you as well. Um, uh, obviously, we, we, we're trying to promote the, the opportunity for best practice and better health. And, uh, uh, and the more people we believe are involved in developing these ideas and adopting these ideas, uh, uh, we, we're going to have a better uh, outcome for our patients, which is what this is all about. Um, so I'm, I'm going to thank my panel. I, th I think you've been fantastic, very clear. It's always incredibly difficult when you've got a lot to say and I've kind of curtail you and cut you off and we bring you back in at different points. But I think, you know, what you've given us a strong sense of there is just by how applying what's already there, out there, in the best way with the kind of commitment that you have provided, both on the supply side and on the buying and delivery side, you can really make a difference to people's lives. And certainly the data in that case study uh, shows what you can do by way of uh, speed, uh, and as people keep saying, speed is brain. Um, you, you know, um, this, this is such an important area. Uh, so, so thank you to all the panel. Uh, hugely appreciate your time. And uh, and again, um, j j just to say that if I'm sure any of our individual uh, colleagues would be happy to follow up themselves if you're interested in hearing more about what they've said today. Um, in terms of just kind of summarising, quite difficult really because it because in a way what we've got has been fairly straightforward here we have a problem it's a massive problem and continues to be a problem and lifestyle problems that we've seen um, people living in isolation and post-covid has exacerbated those problems and so what we are what we're seeing is an increasing demand to, to sort of provide a service to manage stroke and obviously we would love to be in as we all try in the prevention mode, but we know sadly that people will come through and, and uh, uh, will, will suffer from this condition and this, this kind of immediate problem. Here we have solutions that I think are combining the best of bringing accessibility to, you know, Sajid's point about remoteness of, of the sort of East Anglian region and Linda knows that well, but this purely, it shouldn't be seen purely as something for uh, rural communities because I think even in urban communities, the ability to deploy our services are under considerable pressure. And so time is of the essence in urban communities as well. And, uh, and I, th I think that's crucial. We have suppliers who are more than capable of introducing this technology quickly and bring it into play. So this is an immediate sort of benefit. It's not something that we press the button on now and in six years time it will deliver. This can make a difference and would make a difference going into the winter that is going to be very challenging. So we have some immediate opportunities here and we have a good evidence base about what the return on investment is in terms of saving lives, reducing disability and indeed in the wider economic context, tackling inequalities and, and putting people uh, back into uh, environments where they can go back to work and contribute economically. So all of that really stacks up very well indeed. My final point is that to move this forward, this requires, I think, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but it needs engagement at different levels. And I mentioned when I was talking to Linda about integrated care systems. Integrated care systems are now in place with our integrated care boards to make a real difference to the population. This, to me, is an area where, by at-scale adoption, of technology, they, they demonstrate two things. One, the power of technology, but they demonstrate that they can tackle some of these long-standing problems very effectively and prove why we have them, because they have scale. And so I'd really like to see our integrated care boards and integrated care systems really picking this up and starting to do at scale delivery. And certainly this is a strategic sort of like development, but it's a very practical development. And I think, um, you know, this is something that uh, really the NHS, uh, you might say, is is not doing its job very well because we don't have this university deployed at the moment. But we congratulate those people who are early adopters of this. And I hope that we can see this rolled out quickly in other areas of the country, particularly the ones that I live in, by the way, not with a vested interest. But, you know, this is the kind of service that I think, you know, really all our citizens should have, not just those in the east of England or the places where it's deployed across the rest of the country. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to my panel. Thank you for the questions. And hopefully when we do some more of these sessions, 
around uh, uh, the way in which Visionable and Brainomics and others can help. Uh, we'll have other colleagues who will join us as well. But thank you very much uh, and, and uh, enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.